example, last night, uh, the most incredible thing happened to me. I've been here over a year, and I have never experienced anything like this. New Mexico's mystical landscapes have always attracted visitors. Some even say visitors from outer space. But it's not the tales of alien encounters you should worry about. It's the ghost encounters that'll scare you to death. By day, it's easy to see why New Mexico is called the land of enchantment. But when the sun goes down, a more fitting name might be the land of the dead. The most feared ghost in all of Albuquerque is the spirit of a scorned woman roaming the dark streets and wielding a bloody hatchet. They call her the Hatchet Lady. They always describe her as looking like a haggard woman. Her eyes are completely black, like there's no white in them. But the Hatchet Lady didn't always appear so terrifying. She was once a beautiful young woman. In the late 1880s, there was a prominent family, the Armijo family, who was one of the founding families here in Albuquerque. The youngest daughter was engaged, engaged to be married to a local Romeo around town. One afternoon on her regular walk, the love-struck girl came face to face with her beloved fiancé in the arms of another woman. In fact, they were so intimately involved that they didn't notice her there. They didn't even see her. Well, she was shocked, of course, and hurt, but also humiliated because this was where everybody went to make out. So that must mean that if he's back here, everybody in town knows what's going on except for her. The, the humiliation is, was enough to push her over the edge. As she got away from him, that shock turned into anger. She noticed a small little hand hatchet. Unable to contain her rage, she did the unthinkable. She grabbed the hand hatchet, went back around, came up from behind, and struck him repeatedly until all the rage, all the anger was gone from her body. She took the axe and dismembered him. The girl supposedly got away. But perhaps you might not. Residents of Old Town say they've heard stories of lovers chased by the Hatchet Lady's unforgiving spirit. If you're there with a, with a sweetheart of some kind, you know, your wife, girlfriend, or whatever, if you're there late at night and uh, getting a little close, the uh, ghost of the Hatchet Lady will appear and attack you. Many argue that the Hatchet Lady is simply an urban legend. But that doesn't stop patrons on Albuquerque's ghost tour from quivering at the thought of meeting her. If I saw a lady with an axe walking down the street with blood on her, I'd be kind of scared and run. I would be gone that way. <laughs> but the people on this tour have more than one phantom to worry about. The New Mexico Ghost Tour takes guests on a haunting trip through Albuquerque they'll never forget. The most mischievous ghost in Old Town is a little girl named Victoria. Victoria haunts a restaurant called the La Placida Restaurant, which was originally Casa de Armijo. She's the mischievous one because she's the one that has shown up on the tours. No one seems to know the story of this ghostly child. But locals say she's as real as they come. Dawson, New Mexico used to be this buzzing mining town sitting about 17 miles northeast of Cimarron. It's famous, or rather infamous, for being part of some seriously tragic mining history in the U.S., with not one, but two huge disasters that took a lot of lives. Back in the day, under Phelps Dodge Corporation's eye, Dawson turned into something pretty special for the early 20th century. We're talking about a hospital, a theater, and yes, even an opera house. It was the place to be, pulling people from all over the world to work in its mines. But as awesome as it sounded above ground, below was a different story. Mining coal was dangerous work, filled with accidents and the constant threat of black lung disease. 
The first big disaster hit on October 22, 1913, with an explosion in Stag Canyon Mine No. 2 that was so bad, it took 263 miners with it. That's one of the worst mining accidents the U.S. has ever seen. Then, as if that wasn't enough, another explosion in Stag Canyon Mine No. 1 happened a decade later, claiming 123 more lives. Dawson was left with a deep scar of loss and sorrow after these events. Even though there were attempts to make mining safer and a short comeback during World War II, the rise of diesel electric trains and natural gas pretty much ended coal's heyday. By 1950, Dawson's mines shut down and the town got sold off to a salvage company, leaving behind just a few buildings and a cemetery, which is now on the National Register of Historic Places to tell its story. Now when you visit Dawson Cemetery with those white iron crosses marking the miners' graves, it's a real sobering sight. It makes you think about all those folks who left too soon. Plus, there are all these stories about ghostly sounds, whispers, and apparitions around, making it seem like the spirits of those miners are still hanging around, maybe not ready to leave the place that was their life, but also their end. The St. James Hotel in Cimarron, New Mexico, offers visitors unique adventures that just might involve ghosts. This historic structure was rescued from ruin in 1985. Room 4 is the Jesse James Room. Room 17 is the Mary Lambert Room. Room 18 is one you may ask about, but don't expect to stay there. That room allegedly houses the malevolent ghost of Thomas J. Wright. Legend also states several guests died mysteriously in there. The St. James was built by Henry Lambert, who was once a chef for President Lincoln. Lambert's hotel rewarded him through the years. Many notable characters stayed there as time passed. Notable guests include most Old West figures such as Jesse James, Wyatt and Morgan Earp, Doc Holliday, Billy the Kid, Buffalo Bill Cody, Annie Oakley, Kit Carson, and many more. Gunfights often broke out in the hotel. Current estimates suggest that over 25 men were killed in the hotel. The historic hotel was renovated to surpass its former glory. Visitors report the second floor is most active. The most common manifestations are cold spots, the smell of phantom cigar smoke, objects fly off the walls, and electrical items commonly short out. Would you stay at the St. James? Church Street Cafe was built in uh, the early 1700s uh, by the Ruiz family. It had actually stayed in the same family for over 300 years, and the last resident passed away in 1990. Today, the cafe and gift shop is a local hangout. The first time I walked by, I just thought, gee, this is a neat house. I thought, I'd love to be able to restore this house. And so I fell in love with it. But within hours of signing the deed, owner Marie Coleman discovered that the building was haunted. Yes. She began to research the historic building and found it was haunted by Albuquerque's most spirited ghost. We believe it to be haunted by the ghost of Sarah Ruiz, who uh, passed away some decades ago. It is believed that uh, Sarah was a culandera, which is basically a um, healer. She would go out and she would find herbs and and find th certain things that she would store that would cure certain illnesses and, and help people. If Sarah helped people in life, it seems she doesn't like to do so in death. Staff at the Church Street Cafe believe Sarah is upset that each day strangers trespass on her former home. Another waitress and myself, Monica, and I were in here rolling silverware and we heard some silverware and we saw it fling itself across the room. It was really kind of creepy, it was a little weird. Nothing I've ever experienced before. But um, it's just kind of commonplace around here, stuff like that to happen. While ghost activity may be commonplace, it doesn't make it any less creepy. Nobody likes to be ignored. And uh, I believe that this is her way of letting people know, I'm still here, don't forget me. 
and for the ghosts of Old Town, it seems impossible to forget their tragic tales. And they wouldn't let us, even if we tried. I know that ghosts exist because I have seen them. I have seen things with my own eyes that, that I cannot explain as anything other than the supernatural, the spirit world. Right in the heart of Albuquerque on Central Avenue, you'll find Hotel Park Central. It's not just any hotel. It's a cool mix of luxury, history, and a few ghost stories to spice things up. This place has got it all. 74 rooms, 15 fancy suites, and three cozy cottages. It all started back in 1924 as a hospital for railroad workers. Then in the 80s, it shifted gears to become a mental health hospital before turning into the awesome hotel we see today. This spot's history is as colorful as a New Mexico sunset, complete with ghost tales that'll give you the chills. The stories around Hotel Park Central are as old as the building itself, especially from when it was a hospital. Imagine patients being in their rooms and suddenly seeing ghosts wandering the halls, hearing voices with no one around or watching stuff move on its own. These spooky experiences didn't just stop with the hospital days. Even today's guests swear they've bumped into the hotel's otherworldly residents. People visiting Hotel Park Central often say they feel like someone's always watching them, hearing whispers or footsteps when the place is as quiet as a desert night. The third floor? That's the main stage for the ghostly action, with loads of guests claiming to have seen a lady just doing her thing. And for the brave souls, some ghost hunters even checked into the hotel, trying to chat with the spirits using nothing but a flashlight that flickered on cue. Each year, tourists flock to New Mexico to admire its stunning landscapes. But tourists aren't the only ones mesmerized by this mystical state. Throughout this southwestern state are remnants of its past, and the city of Albuquerque is no exception. Much of Albuquerque is a modern metropolis, but there's one spot in town where its history has been preserved. Hamilton, Albuquerque is a place of great history. Very long history, sometimes peaceful, sometimes bloody. This was the frontier, and uh, it stayed the frontier until uh, relatively recently, even in the early 1900s. Old Town, Albuquerque is less than one square mile. Packed in such a tight area, tourists can get a glimpse of what Albuquerque was like 300 years ago. There's old adobe houses, churches, and some say... ghosts. Old town and ghosts. They go hand in hand. The city was founded in 1706, and for more than 200 years, wasn't nearly as tourist-friendly as it is today. As with any Wild West town, there were lynchings and hangings and duels out in the street, shootings. But today, it's easy to forget an uneasy past while strolling Albuquerque's peaceful streets. Well, when people come to Old Town, they're going to find restaurants, they're going to find nightlife, they're going to find shops of all types. Yet after a busy day of sightseeing, a strange darkness inevitably descends on the city. The vibe of Albuquerque, I just love Old Town Albuquerque. I think it's a beautiful place. I especially love it after hours when there's nobody else here. It's just peaceful and quiet and calm. That is, until you run screaming from a ghost. Often you can you'd be walking about the streets at night and you'll stop because you think you hear somebody walking behind you. You turn around, there's nobody there. Back in 1849, Valentin Mays, a guy who made his fortune in the shipping business, built this swanky place in Mesilla. It was all about showing off his success and standing at the top of the social ladder. But behind all that glitz, there was a love story going on that was straight out of a drama. Armando Mays and Inez were head over heels for each other keeping it hush-hush from everyone, especially from Armando's mom, Mrs. Carlotta Mays, everyone called her La Senora, who wouldn't have approved. When the secret got out, things went south real fast, ending in a heartbreaking tragedy with both lovers losing their lives in a super intense showdown. This whole mess left a dark cloud over the Mays family, 
especially La Senora, who couldn't shake off the guilt and sadness. Fast forward to the 1970s, Robert O. Anderson gave the place a new lease on life, turning it into the Double Eagle Hotel. It's a spot that's not just a nod to Mesilla's history, but also a tribute to Armando and Inez, especially when the Day of the Dead rolls around, celebrating the area's rich culture and history. Now the hotel's got some extra guests who've decided to stick around, Armando and Inez's ghosts, who seem to enjoy hanging out with the living. And La Senora Carlotta? She's around too, keeping things low-key, staying close to her son, with her husband's ghost for company. She's known to mingle with the living, leaving a trail of lavender scent behind, making sure everyone knows she's still part of the scene. This is just a quick reminder to subscribe. You'll be notified every time we upload new and fascinating content. If you enjoy this video, hit the like button. These are an immense help to our channel. Thanks, guys. Tourists looking for history in Albuquerque, New Mexico, find it in Old Town. A few blocks of preserved adobe homes and churches. But just outside of Old Town, where the city begins to look more like a modern metropolis, there's one structure that has remained the same. It's Albuquerque's most beloved landmark, the Chemo Theater. There is nobody in Albuquerque that doesn't know about the Chemo Theater. Uh, and frankly, there's nobody from New Mexico that doesn't know about this. The Chemo stands out amid its modern surroundings. And its strange decor carries on inside the theater. From skeletons hanging on the walls to a mischievous child ghost. This theater will not only entertain you, it will scare you to death. The building does have a scary character. There are some people who are quite uh, moved. I feel a presence. Built in 1927, the Chemo Theater was considered the area's finest picture house. It was built as the grandest movie palace in Albuquerque, and people wanted to see it, and they did come and see it. And the unique Native American Pueblo Deco architectural style continues to draw crowds. We have people from all over the world who just come to see the Chemo Theater. Let's see what's playing, but they want to see the building itself. The chemo was special because it was the only theater that was dedicated to the Native American. The theater's royal name is also Native American. The word chemo is actually a combination of two Indian words uh, that mean king of its kind or mountain lion, depending on which way you'd like to interpret it. The 1950s brought cowboy flicks to the chemo screen, making the theater more popular than ever. On a matinee, you might imagine over a thousand kids sitting in there watching any one of the famous uh, stars from that area. We have a lot of photographs of children's bicycles lined up uh, in front of the chemo. They didn't have to fear about anybody stealing their bikes back then. Um, it was a different era. But one afternoon, a tragedy would bring an end to this peaceful time. That day, a group of unsuspecting kids went to the chemo to watch a western. And at some point during the film, uh, one of the young boys, for whatever reason, decided he needed to go downstairs. And while he was on the staircase, there was uh, an unfortunate explosion. An aging boiler suddenly exploded, having disastrous consequences. What took place was uh, a boiler underneath the stairwell exploded, blowing out. Uh, we don't have evidence where this young man was standing, but uh, it did claim his life. And many other people were injured uh, with, uh, with the explosion. A young boy named Bobby was the only fatality. His young life tragically cut short. It wasn't long after he was laid to rest that strange things started happening. Things that continue to this day. 
as you go around and walk up at the end of the night. There was definitely a feeling that there was someone or something in the building when, when no one was there. Recently, while the chemo was under renovation, some nearby office workers got a fright they'll never forget. There was a person in an office across the street called our business office and said, there's a young boy waving at me out of the window of your third floor building that's under construction. So what I did immediately was I went up there. I knew that we had had some construction going on. Doors were locked. I did a thorough investigation. At the third floor. There was nobody up there. There was no way anybody could get in there. Perhaps the spirit of the ill-fated boy is as mischievous in death as he was in life. You can track which performance have gone well, which ones have not gone well. And I would contend that there's a good relationship between those who have not gone well and what they've done in terms of Bobby. They have to take care of Bobby, Bobby doesn't take care of them. Apparently, like most children, Bobby has a sweet tooth that can't go unsatisfied for too long. When large production's set up, usually there's a coffee break in the morning. Uh, nobody wants to be a pig and eat the last donut out of the box, and so the last donut would usually hang around. Sometimes the donut would be gone, and there would have been no one in the building. Could Bobby's playful spirit be the culprit? Many anxious actors and crew were sure of it and began leaving donuts backstage. But for those who don't believe, the punishment is severe. The director of this particular show saw a large number of donuts uh, hanging across the back wall and made the crew take the donuts down. Uh, their next performance was a complete and total disaster. Uh, light bulbs exploded, uh, things fell out of the ceiling, actors fell down on stage, uh, doors and windows on the set opened and closed by themselves. Concerned members of Chemo Productions constructed a shrine to appease the child specter. This is a shrine to our resident ghost. Uh, performers uh, since the 80s have uh, left our ghost a little trinket. Nowadays, Bobby gets an otherworldly assortment of gifts. From guitar picks to lipstick stains on the walls, chemo staff know the importance of pleasing their specter. If you play the chemo, don't mess with the ghost. You, know, you might want to leave a little drink. In the end, those who work and perform at the chemo enjoy having Bobby the Phantom Prankster around. He helps make every single event a little more special, uh, not just for those attending, but for those performing in particular, because they know that there's another presence there. <laughs> the Holy Cross Sanatorium has quite the story, starting off with a pretty practical purpose to support Camp Cody as an industrial site before taking on a whole new role. When it got repurposed into a sanatorium, it became a beacon of hope for those battling tuberculosis, a really tough illness that brought a lot of people to Deming hoping for a miracle. Despite the high hopes, many didn't make it, and the place has its share of sad stories, with some finding peace far from there and others resting in the local cemetery under the guard of Cook's Peak. Those iron crosses and the quiet around them really make you think about all the lives touched by the place. Over time, Holy Cross became more famous for its ghost stories than its history. From love stories written in blood to sightings of ghostly dogs and strange figures, the place got a reputation for being haunted especially the old boiler plant. But if you look deeper, Holy Cross was much more than these spooky tales. It was a sanctuary for many, a place where they came to terms with their fate, surrounded by the beautiful but harsh New Mexico landscape. It represented a final chapter for many, filled with both acceptance and the natural beauty of the area. Even though the buildings might be gone, the stories of those who passed through there, the care they received and the peace some found, Keep the spirit of Holy Cross alive in the community's memory. Big or small, it seems every city in New Mexico has a hidden, haunted past. And tourists who want to escape the city head to the mountainous hideaway of Kingston. Population 28. 
While you wouldn't know it by looking at it, Kingston used to be one of New Mexico's largest cities. In 1882, silver was discovered in Kingston. And frontiersmen looking to get rich quick started showing up in droves. Really, literally, within a few years, there were almost 8,000 people here. There were three newspapers. There's an opera house where Lillian Russell played. Mark Twain came through town. Like many Wild West towns, Kingston's past is stained with both the sweat of hard work and the blood of those that met an unfortunate end trying to find a better way of life. And while there are still reminders of this town's vibrant past, the days of hustle and bustle have long since ended. It's amazing to see the contrast of there being about a little over two dozen folks that live here today full time and the nearly 8,000 that were here during the mining era. Like most mining eras, there's a boom and there's a bust and Kingston had a big one of both. The bust came around the turn of the century when the mines had run their course and prospectors pulled up stakes to find fortune elsewhere. By World War I, Kingston was deserted. Even today, tourist guides to the southwest list Kingston as a ghost town. People will come up and knock on the door and they'll say, you know, I'm looking for Kingston. And I'll say, well, this is it. And they say, well, there's people here. I thought Kingston was a ghost town. I'll just kind of lean forward and whisper and say, I don't see anybody. Do you see anybody? <laughs> just to see the reaction. Locals here are quick to joke about their ghost town status, but as for there being actual ghosts, that's a much more serious matter. Oh, absolutely. I believe this area is haunted. This place has been around since 1919, and boy, has it seen some changes. It started off as a place where folks would come together to pray, but over the years, it turned into the town's go-to spot for fun. Think bowling, reading up a storm in the library, or gliding around in a roller skating rink. Fast forward to 1987, and thanks to the generosity of the Albert and Ethel Hertzstein Charitable Foundation, it got a fresh lease on life. They kept its cool old school vibe while turning it into a treasure chest of stories from the Wild West. The gritty Dust Bowl days, and the tough times of the Great Depression. Walking through the museum is like hopping into a time machine. You'll stumble upon all sorts of bits and bobs picked up along the Santa Fe Trail, each telling its own tale of the old days. And oh, you can't miss the scoop on Black Jack Ketchum, the notorious guy who went down in history for being the only guy to ever swing for a train robbery in New Mexico. The stuff here isn't just old relics. It's a window into the lives of folks who toughed it out during some seriously rough patches in America's story. But hey, there's more to the Hertzstein Memorial Museum than just history. This place has its share of spooky secrets. Ever heard the click-clack of high heels when no one's there? Yep, that's the resident ghost, an older lady who's not quite ready to leave. Paranormal experts even gave it the thumbs up in 2015, confirming there's something ghostly going on, and she's not alone. The museum's got its share of eerie sounds and sights, including a little kid's voice that's enough to give you goosebumps. It's all part of the charm that makes this spot a must-visit for both history buffs and ghost hunters alike. It's the beautiful scenery and laid-back lifestyle that brings New Mexico's visitors off the beaten track to Kingston. But there's only one hotel in town. Lucky for tourists, it's one of the state's most popular lodges. Hi, welcome to the Black Range Lodge. Come on in. The Black Range Lodge was originally built in 1884. It, for many years, was a bar and a restaurant. Hunters would come up rent rooms for hunting season. There was a corral and a barn out back so they could stable their horses and it was a gathering place. In the 1930s the Black Range Highway was created. That was when Kingston was first able to be visited by car. The owner of the lodge at the time suddenly found herself in need of a helping hand. And sometime in the 1940s she found one helping hand. Literally. His name was Sam. No one knows where he came from, how long he worked at the lodge, or how he died. The only detail everyone can agree upon is that Sam had only one arm. Which makes sightings of a one-armed ghost at the lodge all the more chilling. A recent guest to the lodge was having trouble sleeping. 
In the middle of the night, she felt compelled to come out into the common room. Uh, here she saw um, a man, and at first she was confused, and as soon as he saw her, he turned and walked down the stairs. It appeared as though the man had somehow walked through a brick wall leading to the stairs. The next morning, uh, when she came down to breakfast, she told us about it, and she said, you know, and there was something funny about his left arm. That's when we told her about our ghost, Sam. First time I heard about Sam, I thought, this, this is a nice little old lady who's been in this lodge for a long time by herself. I don't know if he was an imaginary friend, you know, or, or somebody who had lived here before, but I thought it was just her way of entertaining her imagination. But even after the lodge changed ownership, unearthly phenomena continued to occur deep within the night and still does. A loner in life, Sam continues to lead a solitary existence. It's kind of a special occasion when somebody gets to see him. And guests have been woken up in the middle of the night by what sounds like firecrackers. In the middle of the night, they heard the crack of pool balls on the table. For the most part, the ghost of Sam keeps to himself and seems to have no intention of leaving the Black Range Lodge anytime soon. Old buildings really grow on you. They have a personality, just a whole character that, boy, I can see how it would be hard for somebody like Sam to even leave because they, they want to just keep doing their job. Visitors to the Black Range Lodge can expect a relaxing, cozy stay and can try to sleep peacefully knowing there's extra help around, always ready to lend a hand. Back in 1905, a family moved into this home, hoping for a fresh start, but instead, they stumbled into a saga of misfortune. The arrival of a frail child and the sudden loss of the father plunged them into a relentless cycle of caretaking and mourning shrouding the home in a melancholic aura. The house seemed to hold on to these sad tales, with neighbors and visitors reporting eerie sounds like a child's cries or the haunting noise of a wheelchair crashing down the stairs. Echoes of the young boy's struggles, even after the family moved on, leaving the house in quiet abandonment. Strange occurrences like flickering lights in the empty child's room and unexplained noises suggested that something remained. As time went on, this place got a new lease on life as a bed and breakfast, but the stories of its past residents lingered. Caretakers and guests would occasionally experience inexplicable cold drafts or the faint smell of decay adding to its mystique. However, under Louise Stewart's care, who took on major renovations, the unsettling ambience seemed to dissipate, as if the troubled spirit had finally found solace or perhaps left the premises, leaving behind a legacy of whispers. Mexico's unreal landscape is best described with one word, beautiful. And in the northern high desert sits a city whose adobe architecture and stunning views are second to none. It's Santa Fe. But if beauty is only skin deep, then perhaps the real heart of this city is underground, where the dead lay sleeping. But this doesn't stop tourists from venturing to Santa Fe in search of its magic. Santa Fe is a unique spiritual experience and it's something you can't put into words it's something that you just feel when you're here from its mountainous landscape to its native american history and an eclectic art community santa fe abounds with things that stir the spirit it's a really amazing place uh, you really get a special feel here that you don't get anywhere else some describe this special feel as the magic of Santa Fe. Others claim it's the ghosts. And it seems that even one of Santa Fe's most beloved getaways is plagued. It's the inn and spa at Loretto. One night while I was asleep in my room, my TV came on in the middle of the night, two or three in the morning. I stand up, I go, I turn off the TV. TV comes back on. I could only assume that it was Sister George toying with me. 
and, and almost playing a prank on me. Many believe the ghost of an expired nun named Sister George enjoys strolling the grounds and terrifying the guests of Santa Fe's Inn and Spa at Loretto. But what is it about this place that makes her spirit cling? It's the most photographed building in Santa Fe because of its adobe type uh, architecture. It stands out in the landscape of the city and it really blends in with the look and feel of Santa Fe as a whole. Original artwork is displayed everywhere you look. Art in Santa Fe plays a, a, a major role in one of our big things in putting the Inner Spa at Loretta together was to make sure that the property reflected the community. We hired artists to design the statues around the pool area, to design the ceilings, to design the furniture in the guest rooms. We like to say it's the art and soul of Santa Fe. And since the late 1800s, the property has been just that. One of the things that really sets the Inn Spa in Loretto apart from any other place around is the Loretto Chapel. The Loretto Chapel sits on the grounds of the hotel. It was built in 1873 and was part of a school that once sat on the hotel's property. The Sisters of Loretto came to the school and chapel to teach local children. When the sisters arrived at the chapel, they were captivated by its strange beauty. But there was one thing missing. The nuns that were there realized that there was no way to get up to the choir area. They literally just had a ladder to go up into the choir loft. Here you had nuns that were in full habit. Uh, you know, their vestments came t clear to their ankles, and to climb up and down a ladder just was not going to happen. The nuns held a nine-day novena, or prayer session, to St. Joseph, the patron saint of carpentry, and prayed for a solution to their problem. On the ninth and final day of this prayer session, this bearded man, the carpenter, shows up over the next few months, the nameless carpenter worked tirelessly. On his final day of building this, uh, this staircase, he left without payment, uh, without ever saying who he was or what he was doing there. Today, the staircase left behind defies all reason. It is a spiral staircase that makes two full 360-degree turns. No physical means of support, no center support whatsoever, built without nails. The wood that was used to build this miraculous staircase has never been identified. Uh, it's not native to anywhere in the world, and uh, scientists and, and builders uh, have, have tried to figure it out. No one knows where it came from. And while no one can be sure who this mysterious carpenter was, some locals say it can only be the work of one man the patron saint of carpentry, St. Joseph. If it wasn't St. Joseph, who was it? But the mysterious staircase isn't the only strange story coming out of the inn and spa at Loretto. There's another mysterious tale that begins in the chapel, but has made its way into the nearby hotel's walls. <laughs> We've got a ghost that, uh, that runs around here at the inn spa at Loretto. Her name is Sister George. Sister George joined the Loretto Chapel hoping to make a difference in the lives of Santa Fe's children. After decades of service, she died one night in her sleep. Since her passing, it seems Sister George remains on the property. Only now, she's a ghost. We've all had experiences, and it has... Um for the better or for worse, we blame it on Sister George. Oftentimes I uh, am working late and if I'm sitting here in my chair on the other side of this wall, there is a copier and the copier often goes off on its own randomly and um, no one's here but me.
I think Sister George is trying to give me a message. <laughs> Evidently, the good sister continues to reach out from beyond. Uh, last night, uh, the most incredible thing happened to me. Um, and I've been here over a year, and I have never experienced anything uh, like this. As I was coming through the chapel shop here, all of a sudden I heard voices. But there was no one else in the building. At least, no one else living. And all of a sudden I realized it was probably, it was about a handful of women, maybe a half a dozen ladies, voices in unison, in prayer form, praying in Latin. I took off running. I've never had that feeling in my life, and I don't get spooked at all easily. Apparently, Sister George is not alone, and staff members are not the only ones to experience hauntings. I've heard stories from, from guests about, uh, you know, seeing Sister George sort of, you know, milling through the sculpture garden, you know, late at night. And I think Sister George is just here keeping, keeping track of everything that's going on and, and making sure that we're taking as good a care of it as she did. So take care when walking the grounds of the Inn and Spa at Loretto, because it seems like at this hotel, there's one sister in the habit of eternally keeping watch. This sandstone beauty from 1892 has seen it all, morphing from a lively shop to a boutique hotel that's practically a time machine thanks to its careful preservation. Keith and Jeanette Barris and Joe Beth Vigil Price aren't just the hotel's keepers. They're like the living memory of Clayton, deeply connected to its history and the stories etched in their family's past. They're particularly passionate about keeping the spirit, figuratively and literally, of the place alive, including the tales of old barroom brawls that are part of their own legacy. Now the hotel itself is something straight out of a ghost story, especially the saloon in room 307, where guests and staff swear they've bumped into ghosts. The star of the show is Irene, a former maid whose footsteps and fleeting glimpses in the wallpaper suggest she's still around. Keith Barris thinks of her more as a protective presence than a spooky ghost, especially after a guest claimed Irene cured their migraine. A spirited older lady who's become something of a local celebrity, especially after ghost hunters gave her the seal of approval. Between this historic hotel and the museum, Clayton's got enough tales of the past and paranormal to keep any history buff or ghost hunter intrigued. In Alamogordo, New Mexico, there's a place where law and legend collide, the Otero County Courthouse. Built in 1956 to replace an older building, this spot's known for more than just its role in the justice system. It's the eerie stories and unexplained happenings that really grab people's attention. Imagine walking through those halls only to see a guy from the 1920s just strolling around or hearing doors slam shut with no one in sight. Even weirder, some folks have had stuff like pens and papers just go flying off desks on their own. And it's not just hearsay. There's actual surveillance footage catching some of these spooky moments in action. There's the story of an employee who felt something or someone messing with her hair while she was alone in the bathroom. Talk about a hair-raising experience. Then there's Kenneth Schaffer, the maintenance guy who's no stranger to the courthouse's chillier side, with doors slamming and sudden drops in temperature that'll give you goosebumps. It seems like almost everyone working there has their own ghost story, making the courthouse famous for its uninvited, unseen guests. While some people might get the creeps from these encounters, others like Teresa Gonzalez find them absolutely fascinating. She's one of the believers, convinced that the courthouse is home to some otherworldly residents. Between the legal battles and ghostly tales, the Otero County Courthouse is anything but ordinary. Since it first opened its doors back in 1885, this penitentiary has seen more than its fair share of dark days. It's like the line between right and wrong got all fuzzy, with too many people crammed into too little space, fights breaking out, and not one but two major riots shaking its foundations. The one in 1980, totally off the charts in terms of chaos and violence, making it a notorious chapter in prison history with 33 lives lost in a nightmare of brutality. All that misery and mistreatment didn't just leave physical scars, it kind of soaked into the walls, setting the stage for some seriously spooky stories. Cell Block 4 is at the heart of it all. That place saw the worst of the worst during the riots, and now it's like a magnet for anyone chasing ghosts or trying to get a real feel for the place's painful history. 
Ghost hunters and visitors keep talking about seeing shadows in old prison uniforms or hearing the clank of cell doors slamming shut out of nowhere. Cold spots pop up like reminders of the souls that checked out in the worst possible ways. But it's cell block 4 that really gives people the creeps. Walking through those empty cells, you can almost hear the echoes of what went down. It's a stark reminder of how ugly things can get and the strength some folks have to just keep going, even when the end is nowhere in sight. Now, with the penitentiary closed and just being used for training or movie shoots, it stands as a ghostly monument to all the lives that passed through its gates. Both the ones that made it out, and the ones that didn't. The theater in Albuquerque is a real gem, mixing up some stunning architecture with a dash of ghost stories. Opened back on September 19, 1927 by Oreste Bacecchi, this place was a big deal from the start. It rocks this cool Pueblo Deco style, which is like a mashup of Native American vibes and Art Deco flashiness. It quickly became the go-to spot for all kinds of entertainment, from movies and vaudeville to big road shows. But it's not all just glitz and glamour. The chemo has a bit of a spooky side too, thanks to a couple of tragedies. Back in 1951, a terrible accident happened when a boiler exploded, taking the life of a six-year-old kid named Bobby Darnell, who was spooked by something he saw on screen and ran out to the lobby. People say Bobby's spirit stuck around, becoming the local prankster ghost who likes to mess with the staff and visitors. Things took another dark turn in 1963 with a fire that almost led to the chemo being torn down. But the folks in Albuquerque wouldn't have it, saving the theater and restoring it to its former splendor. Now, it's a buzzing spot for the performing arts again. Even with all the excitement and performances, the ghostly tales, especially about Bobby and a mysterious lady in a bonnet roaming around, add an extra layer of intrigue to the place. Performers even leave donuts out for Bobby to keep things running smoothly which is just one of those quirky traditions that make the Chemo Theater so unique. Listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the Chemo isn't just about shows and history. It's also a place where Albuquerque's spooky stories live on. Most know Roswell, New Mexico for its visitors from outer space. The little green men whose flying saucers have been spotted in the New Mexico night. And Santa Fe residents talk freely about their visitors from beyond. But a visitor from down below? In Santa Fe, anything seems possible. In fact, the state capital calls itself the city different. Our name is the city different, and the architecture itself just gives you a clue that, well, am I really in the United States or not? Uh, and certainly there's a lot of art in the downtown a lot of characters in the downtown, um, and I think it gives you a flavor of Santa Fe almost immediately when you're on the plaza. Santa Fe is a wonderful place to visit. There are so many things to see and do here. The arts and uh, the cultural that are tied together with the outdoor life and the restaurants. Amazing place to visit. Perhaps the best time to visit is in September during Las Fiestas de Santa Fe. But this isn't your ordinary festival. On the eve of the fiestas, tens of thousands of revelers hold a ritual sacrifice of a 50-foot effigy known as Zozobra. But what is this bizarre burning ritual? It began in the 18th century, when the Spanish peacefully reconquered New Mexico. It was a matter of Spanish pride to retake New Mexico. This celebration came to be known as Las Fiestas de Santa Fe. But surely, the Spanish didn't burn an effigy. The original festival was uh, steeped in religion. It was to honor the Virgin Mary. And the original festival began as going to church and celebrating the harvest. It was done mostly at September, uh, October time, when you would have those kind of harvests. The festival would retain its religious overtones until the early 1920s, when a group of young artists came to Santa Fe and wanted a piece of the action. 
These artists thought that the Las Fiestas of Santa Fe was perhaps too reverent, too religious, and too quiet. So they had the idea of burning an effigy. They had seen burnings of effigies in different cities, in different festivals, specifically the one in Mexico called the Burning of Judas, where an effigy of Judas is made to parade through the streets of Mexico. It is whipped by colored whips by the people that are there celebrating. And then later that night, it's burned. Local artist Will Schuster designed an effigy and set it ablaze in his backyard, much to the amusement of his friends. That was 1924. Two years later, Schuster's effigy burning had gained such a following that festival organizers asked if he would perform it as part of Las Fiestas de Santa Fe. Schuster agreed. All he needed now was a name for his creation. They looked in the end of an old Mexican-Spanish dictionary. They decided for fun that they would choose the last definition that they could find. There was this word, zozobra, anxiety, anguish, and gloom. So thus, by burning away anguish, anxiety, and gloom, you could celebrate this fiesta more fully. So that's how the burning of zozobra, old man gloom, came to be. Though the basic design for Zozobra remains the same. This is the maquette of Will Schuster's Zozobra. The giant effigy is never the same twice. There have been 80 Zozobras so far. But there was one year, and one Zozobra, that most don't like to speak about. It's gone down in history as the year the devil came to town. The story is that on the lot where the Hilton uh, is today, and where the bank actually stands on the southeast corner, that there was a bar there. It's about 1930. They've just burned Zobra. People are streaming into the downtown. They're packing into these bars. And this bar is just about full when this couple walks in. Descriptions of the couple varied, but everyone agreed they were both very attractive and they were very good dancers. So the bar becomes their audience. People who are watching the man dancing say that just as the bells are tolling midnight in the cathedral, they see that the man's feet turn into hooves. And then about a minute later, from his ankles up to his waist, become animal haunches. And right after that, the horns and the tail pop out, and there is the devil himself. Now, the people did not wait to see what happened to the woman. They cleared that bar in less than a minute. And within two weeks, the bar's out of business, because nobody would go in there. And it was knocked down, and then the virtually empty lot waited for the Hilton to be built in the 1960s. Did the devil visit Santa Fe to enjoy the burning of Zozobra? Or was it simply some other demon out in the town? As far as the devil being associated with the festival, I think a lot of people will make what they want of that. But for us that continue the celebration, the devil really doesn't come up in our mind or anything. Um, however, it is associated with those things that go bump in the night. Every Thursday after Labor Day is guaranteed to go bump and boom in the Santa Fe night. Just be sure to bring your love for fiery sacrifice. And some final bad thoughts for old man gloom. With a state as beautiful as New Mexico, it's easy to mask a tumultuous past. But pay heed, the dead in this southwestern state aren't about to let you forget. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.